This is resonance. Solo voy con mi pena, sola va mi condena. Correré mi destino para burlar la ley. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Castillo and welcome to the first episode of Resonance, a music and sound diplomacy podcast that explores the history and cultural significance of musical exchange across the globe. The series seeks to highlight the impact and potential of music diplomacy initiatives at the state and non-state levels and to strengthen the case for music as an important tool of cross-cultural communication in the arsenal of public diplomacy. Playing in the background is French-Spanish traveling musician Manu Chao, performing clandestino. Manu is what I consider to be a worldly musician that exemplifies the musical exchange and the influence that different cultures can have in one's creative output. He's lived uh, all over Latin America and collaborated with street musicians there in Europe and North Africa uh, and he's used a lot of the the sounds that he's gathered uh, from across the world and the message uh, in a lot of his uh, music. Clandestino is a song in Spanish that deals with borders and immigration between Europe and the third world. These two topics will be prevalent in today's musical discussion. Joining us in our debut episode of Resonance is American author, professor, music critic, curator, 2016 MacArthur Fellow and the new chair in cross-cultural communication at Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism, Josh Kuhn. Welcome to the program, Josh. Thank you, sir. Josh, much of your academic work revolves around the musical crossover between the United States and Latin America. Can you tell me about your findings regarding the musical hybridization of these two cultures and the sounds coming out of the U.S.-Mexico border? Sure, but first we got to talk about Manu, man. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, that's a track that, um, you know, is 20 years old, I believe, this year. It's the 20th anniversary of Clandestino, of that record. Um, and sadly, the things that Manu was singing about and writing about in that song, about the one's destiny uh, to be running from the law, one's destiny to be displaced, one's destiny to be dislocated, and in the video for that song, one's destiny to always be judged and evaluated by what documents you hold, whether it's a green card, a passport, a visa. Um, these are all issues that 20 years ago felt urgent, given the state of the world. And they're issues that, um, you know, 20 years seems like today. Right. Um, and so the messages of clandestino and the messages that, you know, politically that that song is getting us to think about are messages that... Um, are everywhere right now, and there are more musicians than ever before are writing about these very, these very same issues of dislocation and forced migration. Um, we're obviously living through it this very moment with the so-called caravan coming from Central America mm -hmm. and the impact of all that movement on the way that music's being made. So I just wanted to say that just as a shout out to that track. Yeah, um, you actually, um, I think the first time I, I heard your name was in a YouTube video where you were interviewing uh, Manu. Manu. Yeah, I, I've um, you know I've been writing about his work um, since the '90s. I've been writing about his work back to Mano Negra, uh, his first band, um, right. no, his, not his first band, but his, his first kind of um, major band. major global band. He did was in a number of bands before that, but Mano Negra was incredibly important in the evolution of what became known as rock en español. Um, even though it, it was rock en español, but rock en francés and mm -hmm. rock en Arabic and lots of other totally. other things. But was um, particularly, you know, the, um, a couple of their records, you know, like you know, an album like uh, "The Casa Babylon" was mm -hmm. like a masterpiece for Latin American rock culture. Totally, yeah. super influential. So I've been writing about him for about, about that music for a long time, and then interviewed him multiple times. I used to have a show here in Los Angeles um, on TV on a. It was a music video show called Rocamole. We had him on probably three times, I think. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, there's one stray, one stray YouTube video out there of um, that has all the different versions of my interviews with him. Oh, great. Um, I know but, he just he doesn't perform here anymore. 
right? He, yeah, been, yeah, I can't remember the last time he performed in the U.S. Uh, or, but we had him at USC. I mean, we had him here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was when was probably it? Probably five years ago or so. Okay. Uh, interviewed him uh, in the Edinburgh School uh, in the auditorium, cool. and um, he performed um, acoustic, and we talked. And um, I actually don't know what he's up to. I know he's been producing a lot of other artists right now, mm -hmm. and writing with a lot of people. Um, and uh, yeah, he's been a major player and influencer in the way that um, the commercial music world. Uh, is being pushed to think about issues of um, identification, documents, papers, borders, totally. et cetera. Yeah, and this, yeah, this song like we were talking about, Clandestino, is about borders. Um, and it's not specifically the borders uh, in America right now that we have with uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. There are the European borders, but the same issues apply. True, although that song actually um, was part was born from it from his experiences at the U.S. Mexico border. Right. So, so mm -hmm. he spent a lot of time in Tijuana um, in the '90s. Mm -hmm. He actually produced um, some really important records coming out of Tijuana uh, in the '90s and was very active at the Tijuana Mexico border. And a mm -hmm. lot of that, his experience, um, from what I, I I gather, from uh, his his experience with police and militarized borders began in a way with his engagements. Um, at the U.S.-Mexico border, right. and then have spread. And he's done some really important work, for example, in Arizona that he did a few years ago, um, playing at the um, uh, in Maricopa County at the detention center there, um, oh, doing wow. some really important advocacy work. There's some he collaborated with 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 Endala and the National Day of Labor Organizing Network. You can mm -hmm. find those videos online. Um, so he's you know the U.S.-Mexico border has been a I think it's safe to say a pretty central um, geopolitical uh, spot for him totally, uh, yeah. in the evolution of his music. Yeah. So. Just going back to the, the the border and and you talking about Tijuana, um, yeah. What what can you tell me about the the musical uh, hybridization or like cross pollination between the U.S. and Mexico and just the culture of border music? So there's lots of ways to answer that. So there, totally. it's, it's very different to talk about the cross pollination between the U.S. and Mexico as it is the U.S. Mexico border. Mm -hmm. So. Um, cross pollination between the U.S. and Mexico has existed, um, you know, at, at a level of of commercial and stylistic influence for for a very, you know long long time, in terms of the um, presence of major record companies and record labels going back, I would argue to the um, you know very beginning of sound recording to the the very first time that um, even the Thomas Edison sent a cylinder um, Edison cylinder record player. Um, uh, to the president of Mexico um, mm -hmm. in the 19th century, um, so that there's been always been a back and forth, musical back and forth, and um, commercial back and forth. Um, so if you look at, for example, that the evolution of music in Mexico City and the imp in the impact of of rock and pop music in the United States um, from the 1940s on, right? So much of that was actually shaped, not exclusively, but but predominantly shaped by commercial forces and industrial forces of the export of music from the United right. States and its impact on Mexico. But at the U.S.-Mexico border, you have a very different um, set of conditions where there there is no import-export in that sense of music. You just have lived experience. So if mm -hmm. you grow up in northern Mexico in a city like Tijuana, um, you're growing up listening to radio from San Diego. Um, you're growing up with direct access to music the second it comes out mm -hmm. um, in the United States. And so the border itself has always been, um, you know, as my uh, friend, the late great writer, uh, Rafa Safedra um, wrote many times that the border is, uh, for him, functions as a kind of crossfader space. The border is a kind of mixing board. Right. And to live there on either side is to always be channel zapping, is to always be code switching, and to always hear these different styles. That has greatly influenced the way that music um, in a city like Tijuana or a city like Juarez, um, and arguably, though it's a slightly different story, but somewhat similarly, farther south in Texas, in Monterrey, mm -hmm. where you have the profound immediate impact of musical cultures, dominant and subcultures from the U.S. Um, that are kind of digested, um, consumed, and then spit out in new um, kind of hybrid forms. Totally, yeah. I think one of those the, the hybrids that you talk about is uh, the influence that, let's say, banda music had in hip-hop nowadays. I think... Um, we have with us a song that you've uh, discussed. I want to play for the public uh, really quick and we can talk about it. Cool. This is uh, Quid and the song is called uh, No Hay Manera. Algo que muchos han tratado Pero ahora Solo Ecuador ha logrado 
no hay manera de que puedas parar esto Como un corrido, Acuera ha regresado con un nuevo sonido Empezar a hacer feria en manera de un rey Un juego muy avanzado para un güey Vivo mi vida y diario la reposo Un par de morros con viejas pero no esposo Y me puedes hallar en la calle cualquier tipo Gastando feria con mi equipo Parece que me hice padrote, mis bolsas no estimo Hasta cambié la moda que camino Y piensas que soy falso, ponte de frente So let's talk about this song do you, you consider this song a representation of the Mexicanization of, of, of SoCal, of Southern California? Um, sure. I mean, I think it's a song that, you know, now belongs to a particular moment more than anything. I mean, this was really a song born out of um, that kind of key moment in the 1990s when um, banda music took over Los Angeles and took, mm -hmm. over, Southern, the Southern Cal took over the Southern California airwaves. Um, you know, and the um, the members of Aquid were were you know raised in South Central um, from a very young age and grew up first performing English language hip hop um, and trying to emulate African American styles. Right. And, uh, and then eventually, with the continuing transformation of South Los Angeles from um, a per more predominantly African American neighborhood to an increasingly uh, Latino neighborhood, um, the presence of Mexican banda music and Mexican norteño. Uh, were all around them. It was music mm -hmm. their family was listening to, they were listening to it at home. And they started thinking, well, instead of trying to imitate something that we are, quote unquote, that we're not, um, why not try to take the things we love in contemporary LA hip hop and mix it in with the sounds that we're hearing at home and the sounds in our neighborhood. Right. Um, and so it, they, they, they were at the kind of tail end of that musical shift that I think, you know, most people would put as you know, that kind of started in the early 1990s, um, where banda became much more, became um, what it is now, which is not a music of Mexico per se, mm -hmm. though of course it still is, um, but really banda became a soundtrack to Los Angeles. And the contemporary banda and, and regional Mexican music industry really now is as much based in Los Angeles as it is in, you know, anywhere in Mexico. Totally. Yeah. Um, and so that's that that moment of the so-called banda hip hop uh, trend, which they were the pioneers of, um, kind of took off and lasted a couple of years. And then it died out um, because it got, I think, overly commercially saturated. Um, so that particular mixture of banda and hip hop, we don't hear so much anymore, mm -hmm. um, though hip hop continues to influence the way that banda producers are making music. But you have fewer, um, that I'm aware of at least, fewer right now, 2018, 2017, 2018, fewer examples of Spanish language hip hop based in banda and norteño. Mm -hmm. So it still exists, but not in the same way that it did when that track came out. I, I just think it's a very interesting combination to just have very traditional quote unquote uh, Mexico, Mexican music with an American form of music which is hip hop and how hip hop uh, can actually adapt to different sounds and not just uh, uh, folklore uh, Mexican folklore it, it, you can hear hip hop all over the world uh, the way it was uh, uh, adopted in Japan for example or in Brazil um, so that leads me to the, my next question um, in a culture uh, shaped by immigration what do you consider to be uh, American music we're talking about uh, hip hop right now, but let's say what what happens when music like hip hop and rock and roll reach uh, foreign audiences? What happens in that exchange? You know, I think on the one hand, I do want to address the the, the music and diplomacy issue because um, you know, in your opening, you you mentioned that there is both the way that music is used by the state and then the way that music Correct. is used not by the state. And so, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to draw that that yes. difference because. You know, most of the way that music has been used by the U.S. government in global diplomacy, um, there's lots to debate about this, of course, but um, there's lots of nuances. But I, I tend to, you know, want to always push back and be cynical about the way that the U.S. government uses popular music um, as a so-called soft power tool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all too often, the music that is being promoted by the U.S. government abroad uh, comes from populations who are... Um, often brutalized and marginalized yes. um, domestically. And so um, I've always been uncomfortable with the way that um, what n a number of scholars talk about is the kind of way that music and other forms of the popular arts and popular culture are kind of um, over-enfranchised, mm -hmm. whereas the people making that music are disenfranchised. Right. Um, and so there's a long history of the U.S. government, for example, you know, loving jazz right. and promoting jazz all over the world jazz uh, as, as American music. Mm -hmm. Well, if jazz is American music, then why aren't the people who created jazz and make jazz treated as equal Americans, mm -hmm. right? And that's still a problem. 
Totally, yeah. Um, and and so, now, now it's the parallel hip hop. It, it's a parallel hip hop, but it's all kinds of things. I mean, I you know I had lots of these conversations um, with my friends in Ozo Motley, um, mm-hmm. who did I think three State Department tours, um, and they have lots of um, c- um, complicated feelings right. about the way that they were being used on the one hand by the Bush administration. Um, but on the other hand, the way they were using the Bush administration mm-hmm. to further their messages. So once they got on stage, they got to do whatever they wanted, and they got right. to create to create alliances um, in um, Asian communities and African communities and Middle Eastern communities um, that perhaps state policy was actually not doing. Right. And so there's all kind. Of, I'm not being. I'm not trying to take one side over the other, but I do think um, there's always been a disconnect between what culture and what music is promoted as representative of America because it makes money, because it's great, because mm-hmm. it sounds good, but that doesn't actually line up with justice and equal rights on the ground Correct. for those populations in the United States. I mean, I remember even, this is probably 10 years ago now, or well, much had to have been a little bit more when, um, I think it was under the Bush administration when there was like a program to promote like Iraqi hip hop, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, well, you're promoting Iraqi hip hop while you're bombing Iraq, right. you know? So so, th- so there's a way that the use of music can be disingenuous and really dangerous mm-hmm. um, by the state, but there's also a way, like you said, and you know, if you read, um, you know, the great uh, Penny Von Eschen book about jazz diplomacy, mm-hmm. um, she gets into all of those different ways that musicians were able to push back against um, state policy um, mm-hmm. and actually critique um, American racism and American nationalism. Um, from the microphone of being musical diplomats. Right. And that's crucial. Uh, and I think you'll be hard-pressed to find musicians who, who don't do that. Right. Um, this is not the same as, like, doing a, um, you know, military tour mm-hmm. um, or, like, playing for the troops and that kind of thing. This is very different. And there, I think those are, the, you know, that there's a... Um, if you're doing a diplomatic tour, it allows you more freedom to... To, to critique than if you are doing a more traditional yeah. playing for the troops kind totally. of thing. You wouldn't necessarily um, recommend a state-driven music diplomacy. Maybe on a non-state level, you would be uh, more open to it, or you think there's ways that we can shape state-driven music diplomacy. Let's say, for example, um, Brazil uh, and with Gilberto Gil, um, how he reached the halls of diplomacy with with his reggae and his message of, of, of social inclusion. Uh, what do you think of that? Was that a good example? Maybe it got us Bolsonaro. I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I, live, I live my life with music and I, that's all I do. I believe in it more than I believe in anything. Right. Um, but I am also careful not to overstate um, the power of what it can do. Um, mm-hmm. I think that music can be radical and revolutionary and build alliances that are otherwise impossible. But I also think it's important not to confuse musical alliance and musical collaboration with actual policy change. Right. Um, and so I'm always suspicious of state-sponsored anything. Right. Period. So, and I think we need to be, uh, particularly when it comes to um, cultural forms that are born at the bottom mm-hmm. uh, and are then commodified and controlled by larger forces. Mm-hmm. Um, I think historically most of the the great work that music has done in the name of social justice in the name of social change um doesn't happen at the organizational level it happens mm-hmm. on the individual uh or at the uh at the kind of informal organizational level where people find ways to connect with each other right. and influence each other um not in a kind of top down way i mean i'm thinking about this a lot right now because i'm writing this book about about music and forced migration in the, you know, in the 21st century. And all over the world, there are programs, music programs, uh, in refugee camps, music programs um, for um, artists living in exile. Uh, and they do amazing work. These mm-hmm. are all nonprofits. Uh, some of them NGO-sponsored, some of them state-sponsored, mm-hmm. some of them not. And they all do really great work, but there is a kind of built-in uh, limit, maybe, um, to the way that, that these projects exist only as projects. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't actually have an afterlife, and they don't produce lasting social impact. In um, and I think it's important just to keep our eye on that as we go forward. Totally, yeah, yeah. I I, I find it appealing 
just the the whole concept of like south to south diplomacy mm -hmm. let's say like what we're talking about Manu Chao uh, and like the whole Zapatista culture yeah. in uh, um, in Southern California and just that that kind of connection um, that leads me to uh, this but just just to clarify yeah Manu was not south to south Manu's north to south. I mean, he's very much a European. Right. You're so, correct. so he's a European artist, and that's yeah. been a among the critiques of that's Manu. True. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Is that he's all and he's always been on major labels. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he, when he was doing his work, he was doing it on Virgin. That's true. Um, and I guess were, his message is just south, but he himself his message is south to south. Yeah. And I just want to be fair. And you know, I'm a big you know admirer and fan of what he's done. There's also been significant critique of what he's done by musicians in the Americas and in mm -hmm. Africa. Um, that there's a kind of helicoptering of touring in and coming in and falling in love with local music and then making a big record about it. Um, and then those artists might not get paid or might got, not get the support Interesting, that yes. they should. And so I don't have evidence to back that up, but those are mm -hmm. some of the critiques that I've heard over the past right. 20 years. Um, it doesn't take away from what he's doing, but but it is, there's there's I, I would argue against that he's south to south. I guess when talking about south to mm -hmm. south, I'm thinking more of like, future projects that could include a conversation between, let's say, the different cumbieros from Latin America, like a cumbia from Peru, mm -hmm. coming from the Amerindian uh, uh, ghettos with Colombia. Sh they share a very similar uh, uh, Western African background. Yep. Um, and there's an aspect of empowerment there and just giving them that voice. I don't know if it, it could... Look, I think that's happening all over the place. I think if you look, if you look at, you know, one of the top three grossing most commercially popular artist in the world right now j balvin mm -hmm. you're talking about a colombia you know a colombian artist who's making puerto rican reggaeton right. that's rooted in jamaican immigration and panama that's also influenced by u.s hip-hop and r&b um you know all of those styles are coming out of um both the global south mm -hmm. um and or marginalized populations in the united states right. um and so it is interesting. I mean, I was in Europe earlier this year for a while, and everywhere I traveled, the music I heard on coming out of cars, the music I heard on, you know, at, at beaches, on radios, whatever, it was all reggaeton. Yeah. Um, whereas 10 years ago, it would have been English language rock or English language hip hop. Totally, yeah. But this was all Spanish language reggaeton everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting. Now, what are we going to, you know, what does that actually mean? And I've been you know, talking about this for the uh, last few months, trying to figure it out. Like, does it actually mean anything when reggaeton is now arguably the dominant form of pop music in, in the world? Maybe it's taking over from hip hop. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean something in terms of what kind of cultural change is to come? Right. And the same, the same thing could be discussed uh, about trap music. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, I went to Cuba um, some months ago and I was surprised by the amount of trap music it's in, in spanish obviously but it's very similar to the sounds coming out of here very interesting stuff too. yeah and, the, and that's everywhere i mean you could even do a tour of spotify playlists i mean there's a there's a fill in the blank trap playlist for multiple locations around the world i mean the arabic trap movement's massive <laughs> Game face. But it's similar to what you were saying before about 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 hip hop as a as a malleable platform, right? I mean, part of what makes hip hop uh, and it's what has always allowed hip hop to quote unquote go global and influence people around the world has been its, its connection to political change, mm -hmm. its connection to um, propositions of radical social revolution, um, uh, of black pride. And you can then take that, um, you know, black pride and black rage going back to the, you know, 1980s and 1990s can be flipped into um, Palestinian pride and Palestinian rage, Brazilian pride and, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, but then musically, of course, you know, hip hop can be very complicated um, as a musical um, style, mm -hmm. but it also is, has pretty simple um, building blocks, which is to say you need a voice, 
you need a beat. Um, and if, if you look at why trap has taken over, it's like it's a rhythmic pattern that once you learn how to em, you know, emulate it and program it, which is not an easy task, I'm not saying that at all, um, but then it's a blueprint. And then you can just let, you know, lay rhythmic storytelling uh, right. on top of it. And so it travels well. I mean, hip hop's a very portable, um, it's a very portable platform, which is, and, and all platforms that are portable have immense, um, political potential. I fully agree. Uh, so let's move on to this short section that I call the musical piece breakdown. Um, I'm just going to play a song that I chose. Uh, we can discuss a little bit of the DNA uh, behind it. And uh, since we have you, we can discuss a little bit of the political uh, message behind it. Sure. Um, so the song is uh, La Bamba Rebelde. I don't know if you're familiar with, it, with Las Cafeteras. I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, this tune. Uh, I chose it not only because it's a remake of La Bamba with an East LA twist uh, in Spanish, obviously, but uh, I find it interesting that obviously La Bamba uh, has West African roots and it's uh, considered a, a wapango, son jarocho, and it's a it, it's a song that uh, shows the amalgamation that we're discussing. Uh, this happened through slavery, of course, uh, uh, forced migration. And that combined with the Spanish influence of colonization. And I just find it fascinating that uh, a song like that becomes uh, uh, a fo Mexican folklore uh, standard in a way. And then it can cross the borders and become a more of a politically... Uh, a, a political message for these group of uh, uh, of Chicanos in East LA speaking out for the for the marginalized and the undocumented. Um, what uh, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, I mean, La Bamba is a very very important song um, for the work I do, and a very important song for Southern California and Los Angeles, and for all the conversations we've been having. As you said, it's a song that um, is impossible without. The history of slavery and its connection and, and its connection to Mexico, without the history of colonization in Mexico, it's a song that has, in its original form, that's rooted in a revolutionary politics, a bomba as a revolution. Um, and then as it moves north with Mexican migrants, and it starts to, I mean, it starts moving north with Mexican music, you know, with Mexican bands and musicians, particularly in the 1940s and 50s, um, and then gradually. Um, with um, Mexican migrant families who start um, to immigrate to, the, to, to Southern California um, becomes, you know, a kind of um, iconic pop song of Los Angeles and Southern California with Richie Valens. Um, and Richie Valens' relationship to this song is really, really important. That often gets, I think, uh, erased from these stories um, is that, you know, he his, his parents um, met at a, you know, World War II munitions plant in Long Beach before they moved to Pacoima. He grows up speaking English, not Spanish. He learns the song in Spanish from um, his, his, his aunt. 
um, and writes it. You know, she has to write it out on a piece of paper for him to actually learn the Spanish. Um, he wanted to be to be a black musician. Mm -hmm. I mean, Richie Valens before he was Richie Valens um, uh, was Little Richard of the Valley. He right. wanted to be Little Richard, <laughs> um, and in fact, on the original La Bamba recording that he made with Bob King, Keen um, in Silver Lake, um, you know, I'm uh, sorry, that he made in Hollywood. They rehearsed in, in, in Silver Lake. Um, all the players on that original recording were African American. Um, major black musicians from Louisiana, um, from the U.S. South, who had migrated to Los mm -hmm. Angeles in the 1940s and 50s. Um, some of the most, some of the most important um, session players. And so here you have this song that becomes a huge hit in in with Spanish language listeners, but also non-Spanish language listeners. That is actually played by African American musicians by a Mexican American who doesn't speak Spanish. Right who is singing a song that he knows from his family. And the rhythm that he records it in is actually not the original rhythm. It's a cha-cha-cha. Right, so it's yeah. Afro-Cuban mm -hmm. um, at the same time. And then multiple, multiple artists since then uh, have done versions of La Bamba. This is a song that's been very important in Los Angeles. Obviously, Los Lobos takes it to an, you know kind of another level and then um, helps to uh, bring new light to Richie Valens' career and legacy. But um, the whole Son Jarocho movement in East Los Angeles and Boyle Heights, um, you know, there's so many groups before Las Cafeteras who have been using La Bamba and talking about La Bamba. So this is a song that has a lot of um, flexibility um, and a lot of meaning for so many populations. And I think it's a great example of how music travels and then how music can be used by different communities and different generations um, to create new kinds of statements. I totally agree. I think also the... The aspect that it's it's an easy song to play and a lot of folk music is very simple um, and that provides it accessibility to a lot of people because uh, I, I I think sometimes with music like jazz uh, classical of course it's it's limited to a, a certain population that has to dedicate years and years of discipline as opposed to more street just pick up a guitar True. make some sound but I do want to say there's nothing simpler pick upable about Son Jarocho. Um this is a very complicated tradition. Right, but I mean like in in terms of a when you're raised in that culture, yeah. So sometimes that's it you're it's part of your rhythm, sure. you know, like Absolutely. I know it's a little harder for people that have never been exposed to like uh rhythmic like the triplet rhythmics mm -hmm. of West Africa to like catch up to that, but yeah. when you're raised with that like the same thing could be uh said about Afro-Cuban music, you know, like I know they do a lot of musical exchange and they send musicians to Cuba to learn their rhythms and it's it's harder because it's not part of your right. your your culture I guess um but yeah so uh, just one last question before we uh, wrap this up um let's bring it back to to public diplomacy public diplomacy emphasizes listening as a crucial step towards cultural understanding you advocate learning through listening and have highlighted uh, the shared experiences that are created by engaging and listening to each other How does listening create community? Well, I think listening is the first step towards any kind of coalitional uh, connection, right? So, you know, if 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 you are gifted um, with the ability to listen, right, and you can hear uh, and you can hear music, you're already from from birth already um, unconsciously aware of the fact that your identity, one's identity, is based in large part on somebody else's sound story. What I mean by that is, if you listen to a song that you love, a song that becomes your own, that you think is, this is my song, my favorite song, it's a song that has literally entered your body, right? It's entered your body through vibrations, into mm -hmm. your blood, your tissue. That's someone else's breath. That's someone else's soul. It's someone else's body. It's someone else's blood that becomes yours. And so music is a really important platform to begin conversations about how to think about relationality. So these, it, it can help to break down these mythic constructions of a self that has nothing to do with the other. Right. There is no I without you, no I without thou, um, to use the famous, you know, uh, Martin Buber formulation, um, and music is a way of doing that. No team, no assembly, no organization can exist without listening. Um, 
many critics have talked in the past about the importance of, let's say, of a jazz ensemble um, as a key framework for imagining new kinds of democratic belonging in the sense that if you have, you know, five musicians on a stage and no one's listening to each other, no music's going to be made, no music any of us want to hear. In order to make something out of a collective, every individual who's part of that collective must figure out the difficult task of how to be oneself and solo at the same time that one is listening to somebody else's voice so that one can figure out who one is. Right. And without that listening component, there is no us, there is no we. There is no we without the multiplicity of individuals listening to each other before and while they're speaking. And so listening can, I think, be a really helpful me, um, tool of mediation in that way. It can be a really helpful way of um, making sure that any kind of coalition is based upon this radical knowledge that in order for me to speak, I need to be listening to what someone else is saying. So music, sure, has been used by governments and used by um, State Department, for example, but I often feel like it's actually not used to its most radical potential. Mm -hmm. So on a a person-to-person level, just normal citizens, um, you've talked a lot about listening to the border and listening just the actively listening uh, as much as we see things because mm-hmm. we are very visually driven, but our our senses are not limited to our, our eyes. Um, how can we listen better at the borders and uh, at the people that need to be listened to the most? I mean, listening has always been active so versus hearing, which is you know traditionally thought of as more of a, a, right. a, 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 a passive experience. We hear without meaning to, but we must listen with meaning, just as the way we can think about in the history great. of Western knowledge of enlightenment philosophy, um, you know, the idea that vision is the thing by focusing on something, knowledge comes. Um, that intelligence and um, rationality Um, and knowledge are all based in these ideas around vision of being able to see a particular way that produces vision. I think we need to, uh, I and and, and countless others have argued um, that we need to be advocating for the same thing um, through sound, right? That just in the way that we can focus with our eyes on a particular idea or a particular problem or a particular issue, um, we need to be listening for things. So how we listen is going to shape the way we know and it's going to shape what kind of um, society we want to be in. So where we choose to listen to, who we choose to hear, how we choose to negotiate um, any uh, acoustic relationship um, in public is going to determine what kind of social order that we belong to. And so listening is um, takes agency. It takes training. Mm-hmm. It takes practice. Yeah. I've been doing it my whole life, and I'm not even close to where I want to be. Um, it means what do you, when a song comes on the radio, what are you listening for? Um, a lot of my students um, will get grumpy during my music classes because um, they suddenly will complain that like, well, now I'm hearing things I didn't want to hear. Mm-hmm. Right now I'm thinking about things I didn't want to think about. I just wanted to love that song. Right. right. But now I'm actually listening. Oh, this song is problematic because of this. Or this song has all these other kind of meanings I never thought it had. Um, but listening is a critical skill. And I think that we um, don't utilize it uh, as such uh, as much as we can. Josh, thank you very much. Thank this you. This was a very enlightening interview. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.